your uh, PowerPoint in the presenter mode? Because I think um, I wish you can. No, I'm using the um, um, Google slide. I think this is. We'll have to stop sharing for a minute until Darren, Dr. Slade puts up your bio note. All right, you're good to go now? I'm starting. We're Hello, good. everyone. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the 2023 International E-Conference on Holocaust Studies. My name is Dr. Mehak Burza, and I'm the head of the Holocaust and Religious Studies in the Global Center for Religious Research, founded and headed by Dr. Darren Slade. Keep in mind that each of these presentations are video recorded, so the information presented here will be available free of charge to you just for coming out and supporting us. So thank you for that. Now for those attending live, feel free to use the chat box to discuss with other attendees or to ask questions as they come up. Our speakers will do their best to answer your questions at the end of their presentations. You'll also be able to unmute yourself at the end so that you can directly ask the presenter questions by your own. And with that said, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce you to our speaker for this session, Akinam El Dubi. She's gonna speak about Negotiating Holocaust Memory in 21st Century Israeli Theatre. She is a PhD candidate in the Department of Theatre Arts at Tel Aviv University and a Chateau Bryan Research Fellow at Serimam. Her research interests involve Jewish and Israeli theatre and the adaptation of historical events, rituals, and canonical texts to the stage. Aldubi's doctoral project examines theatrical representations of Shoah remembrance in the early 21st century Israel, where she explores the performative modes of negotiating history, trauma, and identity. She holds an MA in theater studies from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and her thesis was on theatrical performances of rabbinic literature. So the floor is all yours, Akinam. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I said, I'm very, um, it's weird to say glad, but grateful um, to be and to share and to reflect with you today. Um, so um, I must begin with this uh, very moment when we're talking about theater. It's always about what's happening now and when the performance is being staged with the relation to the to the current event. Um, so the talk I prepared uh, in early October about negotiating collective trauma isn't and cannot be the same um, for two reasons. One, emotionally. Right now I'm speaking um, on a night off while I'm still in my army um, duty in a unit. Uh, when we're looking, finding clues for the citizens who are still missing after the terror attack on October 7th, and my heart is just uh, bleeding with pain um, that is being held all in and, and around me, all around um, our country. And second is, um, I can say professionally or just uh, research-wise, um, thinking about Holocaust and representation Holocaust in Israeli society, uh, things have changed in the past uh, almost two months. Um, some of the demons that found their place maybe inside a closet came out strongly. And um, my research is about the reflection on trauma. Um, and it's impossible to reflect while you're still, the event is still occurring. So I'm, I'm pro professionally, I'm in this uh, state of how can I talk about reflection while still being in the event um, itself. Um, so with these, within these questions, I came into some of the questions that are walking with me that I would like also to discuss, um, discuss with you and understand through this very moment. And this is the, the question of the co collectiveness of, uh, of the collective trauma or the collective uh, memory. And I'll explain. 
So in the past uh, almost two months, many of my very dear friends and colleagues around the world um, send me messages asking or saying, I hope that you and your families and your loved one are safe. And although I was very touched by the care, I felt kind of odd reading these uh, words. And only when one of my colleagues, a, a German scholar, wrote to me, uh, I know that it's a hard time for your country, your nation, your people. It came just sharp, clear that this is what it is about. I do care and worry for my um, for my siblings, for my friends, for relatives that I'm still waiting to mourn. Um, but the story is is about the collective, is about the, the past, the present, and the possibilities for um, for the future. And so when coming to talk about um, collective trauma or Holocaust on mem Holocaust memory in 21st century Israel, this idea of collectiveness um, must be understood. And maybe a, um, a way to explain it is um, this uh, symbol, this dog tag that is being um, wear by the, uh, worn by a lot of people that is translated very different to English. In Hebrew, it says, Halev shelanu shavui be'aza, our heart, our art is being held hostage in Gaza. But the English translation is bring them home back now, <laughs> bring them home now. So it's it's not the same, it's two different energies. And when I was asking why it was translated like that, um, some of the people that were behind it said, uh, we're not sure people will understand what does it mean. Um, the, so every society has its own collectiveness. And I'm not saying that it's something unique, but this is something that with the current event in this moment, when we're talking about collectiveness, this is this, our heart. Um, and with that, this, uh, the question that comes to me is when, um, when a, someone else's stories become my story, right? When, what is this line? When we're talking about Holocaust memory and the, the um, transition into the post-witness era, when we need to tell a story what it, which is not ours, when we have responsibility over it or when can we talk about it in first person in the i or the we um so um the arts and particularly theater as an interactive and collective um medium when actors step into someone else's shoes in a, in order to tell their story maybe can give us some insights into this process of stepping in someone else's story and creating this collectiveness. Um, so theater has long been recognized as an important arena for confronting past events. The aesthetic choices made by artists in portraying history have a powerful influence on how audience perceive and remember events. When the audience have an immediate personal or cultural connection to the painful histories that are being per, uh, portrayed, aesthetic choices can play a crucial role in shaping the audience's emotional experience. They can either evoke strong feeling of trauma or aid in the process of understanding and uh, reconciliation with the past. Therefore, my baseline is um, there, it's very important to carefully consider the aesthetics in which past events are being presented. Yeah, and here we have the, the Persian by Aeschylus that we just, one of the, the ancient stories that are being presented on, um, uh, histories that are being presented on um, a Western uh, theater. Uh, when talking about artistic representation of more current history or the Holocaust, many well-discussed ethical challenges came in mind, uh, in mind, some of them we also discussed today earlier, um, the tension between fiction and reality and the artistic liberty, etc. But within the discussion of the ethics, something interesting is to track the changes in the aesthetics of theatrical representation of the Holocaust over time, and to see how they might reflect aspects of the role that memory um, plays in society and um, individuals' identities. 
So in my work, I focus on the aesthetics of Holocaust representation in contemporary um, Israeli theater. And as we all know, Holocaust memory is, of course, a central yet very complex element of Israeli society. Accordingly, over uh, the years since the 40s until this very moment, tomorrow night at the Bima uh, National the uh, Israeli Theater, um, the Israeli theater performed a significant body of theatrical um, events dealing with the Holocaust. While taking not notes on hundreds of Shoah-related performances, I realized that while the re representation of the 20th century were studied deeply, the 21st is still waiting to be studied, and this is what um, I'm focusing on my uh, in my project. Um, and something interesting is happening in the 21st century. But let's begin from the beginning. So, in the 21st century, research on theatrical representation of the Holocaust, examining how evolving aesthetics reflect the ability to address both individual and collective trauma. From the 50s to the 80s, the aesthetics um, that are being discussed are aesthetics of allegory, presenting something through something else, like in the case of the palace owner, one of the famous um, pieces in, um, uh, in Israel, and documentaries, representing primary sources that shed light on part of the events. We're often implemented in a dramatic representation of the Holocaust. Although both are valuable aesthetics, they are not capable of fully experiencing the traumatic experience, as allegory cancel out the connection to specific time and space, while the commentary is bound into historical facts without leaving room for experiencing fragmented experience. So in the 80s and 90s, artistic representation of traumatic events shifted towards a postmodern style, um, uh, intentionally avoiding arranging memory in a factual, linear, or coherent manner. Um, and, and this aesthetic um, exaggerate the traumatic experience through deconstruction methods like non-rational images, long static monologues, uh, conductory um, information, and overlapping sound. These aesthetics of fragmentation express the past without order, emphasizing the physical experience rather than the complete story. The postmodern aesthetics of fragmentation was also incapable of effectively presenting memory as it paradoxically um, breaks apart the very memories that they're trying to present. But in the 21st century, um, as a response to the evolving artistic landscape and cultural sensitives, a new aesthetics trend is emerging within Israeli theater. This trend introduced fresh approach into Holocaust related events that is distinct from earlier methods of depicting trauma. This is what I call the reflective aesthetic. Unlike the documentary and the uh, aesthetics of fragmentation approach that evolved in the 20th century, in the early 21st century Israeli theater, um, the reflective aesthetic emphasized the distinction between experience and the way that it's being remembered, highlighting the, um, the very different between the past and the way we shape the memory of it. So unlike other theatrical works that represent historical events of traumatic experience, these under-researched cases focus on memory transmission itself, questioning how and why Shoah memory is being remembered, formed, and reformed. Therefore, what is so interesting for me in these um, uh, plays is not their potential as educational tools to transmit memory or preserve the past, but rather the values as a precious arena to reflect on a way memory is transmitted, how one person's stories become someone else's story. So reflection um, is a process of looking back at the event or action that has take, taken place, right? The term reflection comes from Latin, uh, the word reflector, which means 
to turn back. According to uh, John Dewey, reflective thinking is often connected to state of doubt, confusion, or mental difficulty that promotes individuals to rethink their experiences and to critically evaluate them. The goal of reflection is to challenge basic assumption and to create deeper and more complex understanding of the way we perceive the world. So why now? Why this reflection aesthetics is emerging um, now? There can be many um, responses or uh, possibilities, but one of the main one is, of course, um, the, the changes in the landscape of, uh, of memory. Um, the reflective paradigm is growing in response to the shifting center of memory as we move towards what Diana Pupesco refers to as the post-witness era. In this time, the transition of memory from the living memory, first-hand oral testimony, to the mediated memory, the second-hand form of representation is, is unavoidable. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges of this transition is that while the stories detailed are preserved, the embodied action of telling is being lost together with the original teller. So who becomes the new teller? Um, what are they what are they doing with the story and uh, with that um, what they do with what they know about the story and the facts that they, they don't know so this is what I want to focus on about um, today I will examine this question of who tells the story who is the new teller um, by uh, examining two performances um, it, there are two one-woman contemporary Israeli plays that vividly present the intergenerational memory shift. So the first one is My Ex-Stepmother-in-Law by Nomi Oeli, and the second one is Are You from the Holocaust by Renana Menkin. In both plays, the performers host an audience in a theater space designed as a home of a descendant's Holocaust survivor. In these intimate spaces, the performers share their stories of the Holocaust survivors while playing dual roles. Yoeli plays herself, a second generation survivor of the Holocaust, and her stepmother-in-law, um, the first generation survivor. Menkin plays herself, a third generation of the Holocaust, but she presents her memories as she was a four generation child. Therefore, the discussion today will weave together voices of four generations. So I will first describe each place and then we'll see how the memory is being shifted or expanded from one person into another. So my ex stepmother in law is a play by Dr. Nomi Yoeli. As I said, Yoeli was born in Israel in the 50s and grew up in, surrounded by many Holocaust survivors and under the agony of the loss of her parents' families in, back in Poland. Therefore, she is culturally considered as a second generation of the Holocaust. The show begins when Yoeli welcome the audience when they are entered the theater. Then, after everyone has found a seat, she walks to a microphone stand, and in a stand-up comedy style, she also uh, she shares various funny anecdotes relating the role of the Holocaust in her life. In her stories, she also mentioned her unique connection with Aggie, an artist, Auschwitz survivors, the stepmother of her ex-husband. Following the short opening story, Nomi invites an audience member to the stage. After a few long moments of waiting, when a brave volunteer step on stage, Nomi instructs the guest to spin the top of the round kitchen table that is on the stage. As the table rotates, Nomi transforms into Agi, her ex stepmother in law, by changing only her gestures and her voice, adding a light Hungarian accent. When the roulette steps on one of the six drawers under the table, Agi invites the guest to open the drawer and take out an object that relates to Agi's life, such as clay, photographs, or a piece of cake. Aggie encouraged the guests to interact with the object while having a um, spontaneous conversation, asking questions about their life and sharing memories from her rich biography. Every evening, 
The guests are different, shaping the order of the story and the manner in which is delivered. The place continues as Yoli alternates between the two characters, herself, Nomi, at the um, stand-up stand, and Aggie, who hosts the guest around the table. Would something be different in the other performance that represents two um, third and fourth generation? Let's see. So Are You From the Holocaust is a play by Renana Menkin. Menkin was born in Israel in the 70s and grew up with two sets of grandparents who were Holocaust survivors. Therefore, she is considered third generation of the Holocaust. In the play, Menkin shares the story of her grandfather as Nina, a fourth generation child. While Nina in Hebrew literally means great granddaughter, this name also refers to Menkin's nickname, Nani. Therefore, Menkin plays a fictional character who is both herself and her potential daughter. We won't get into it now, but she presented these performances over 25 years, so um, at some point her daughter actually became her age of the play and it became more complex and interesting, but this is for another time. Um, but as far as I know, this play is the first play in Israeli theater that represents four generations on stage. The play takes place in a, a space designed as Nina, great grand um, uh, mother living room during a Shiva, the Jewish tradition to mourn for seven days after the death of a family member. In this case, the death of Nina, great grandmother, um, who just passed away in the play. As the audience entered the space, Nina treats them as if they were the family friends who came to support the mourning family. Nina offers the audience cake and tea and explains that since her grandma is asleep, she will keep them company and tell them stories. Nina is mixer, mixing her own stories with the stories of her great grandmother, moving freely back and forth in time. As the story pieces comes together, we learn that the great grandmother was the only survivor left from her family and that Nina is the only living soul with whom her great grandmother ever shared her story. Aware of the situation, Nina expressed her sense of deep obligation to carry the memory onwards, yet her concerns about her ability to do so. She's always playing with the possibilities of maybe not telling anyone and letting the story be forgotten so she will not be from the Holocaust. Nina interacts with the audience, asking, are you from the Holocaust? This question at the beginning is received as a naive question of a child trying to find someone who maybe shares her great grandmother's story. But the show continues. Uh, as the show continues, this question becomes charged with more meanings. What roles that the Holocaust plays in your life? Is it part of your story? What are you doing to do with this story? Every evening, the answers she receives from the varied audience are very different. So this play is weaved from the stories of three women, the third generation who tells the story of the first generation from the point of view of the fourth generation. Once again, the character story is mixed with the stories of the audience. So what of this performance shows us about this taking upon us stories which are not which we haven't experienced personally? Both performances are set in a house of first generation who are not present. So the ones to tell their stories are the next generation. In your early plays, um, but although the generations are different, the survivor stories are also delivered differently, right? In your early play, we meet and interact with Aggie around the table, right? The first generation survivor in her kitchen. However, in Menkin's play, we enter the great grandmother living room after she has already passed away. Furthermore, in your Eli play as second generation, she tells the stories as and her stories and Aggie's memories separately while trying to transmit Aggie's memories as close to the way she received them. In contrast, Nina, the fourth generation, tells her story mixed with her great-grandmother's stories as she heard, understood, and interpreted them. 
The theater stage then reflects clear, clearly on the shifting center of memory as it expands from the original source, the witnesses, to the following generations, what we call the memory carrier. For many political, social, historical, ethical, and philosophical reasons, testimony by witnesses became the main tool to transmit the memory of the Holocaust. One of the challenges of this transition is that while the story's details are preserved, as I said, the embodied action of telling is being lost along with the original teller. Many artistic attempts are being made to preserve the testimony and make it accessible, including the one that we uh, discussed yesterday with the um, um, Holocaust Foundation, the amazing, not hologram, but hologram um, project. But considering that a lost, again, is not of knowledge, written or recorded, but of a performative act, an interaction, we create a gap in the story while we're trying to preserve the testimony. It stays their story, yeah? And not the stories of the current generation. So what we need to do? As we move to the post-witness era, we need to consider a paradigm shift from witnesses into something else. These performances point out other option to deal with the, with the story, and this is interaction the very basic part and let's look into it the very basic fact about interaction is that is a dynamic mutual situation between at least two people a listener and a teller and when we're looking at it it's not about the knowledge it's about all the settings everything that happens in the in the moments that gives us various um, aspects of of the story let's look closer of the listener and on the teller and what happens then? Back to the, so the listener. The performance are based on, both performances are based on audience participation. Both creators told me that they had decided to set um, the, the plays in a, a home setting to create this interaction, this intimate space that they, they'll be able to interact with the audience. In your Ellie play, your Ellie's play, the audience member are the ones who have have the responsibility to evoke Aggie memory by choosing to come up to the kitchen table, opening a drawer, listening and asking questions. Hence, the play's central drama is not the plots of Aggie's stories, but rather the live interaction between Aggie and the guest and how it affects the way in which the story is being told. The interaction helps them to share intimate stories. Nomi, who had listened to Aggie's, her stepmother-in-law, stories for over 40 years, needed a listener who would take her place as a listener so she could take her the place of Aggie in telling her stories. In the same way, in Menking play, the story is only being told because the audience came to the Shiva to listen to the story of the descendants and share their connections. The play's main drama is not the plot of the great grandmother story, but rather the way Nina perceived it and understand it. Menkin said that it was important for her, that the audience will feel at home, that the same way she felt at home when her grand, uh, grandmother told her a story. And I'm quoting, these stories cannot be shared when I'm alone on stage. I needed to have someone to talk with. In these plays, then, the role of the listener, or if you like to add more philosophical ideas into it, so the significant other, the mirror, the gaze, the Tao, that is broadly discussed, is shown brightly, emphasizing the shifting responsibility from the teller to the listener. But what is so interesting is that it does not stop there, because these plays, the listener is also becoming the teller. What do I mean? In Yoeli plays, Aggie encouraged the audience to interact with the objects that represented pieces of her memories and shape them as they wish. In that way, a story about Aggie's childhood, um, 
And in Hungary, playing with clay is expanded to a memory of a middle-aged woman who recalled dish of her Lubin, um, Lubian grandmother uh, used to make. On another evening, in the same scene, a young man shared his passion for art, and on a different evening, Aggie's childhood memory evokes the guest childhood memory of the Gulf War. In a similar way, Nina asked the audience member, excuse me, are you from the Holocaust? If you can imagine the various audience that are, were in this place over the past 25 years, you can probably already sense how different the answers could be. So on one evening, she told me a Holocaust survivor shared for a quite a long time her story. On a different evening, someone responded, yes, and surprise, surprisingly added, and I even know, knew your dear grandmother since she were a friend of mine in high school and shared stories that making have, um, haven't heard before. The same way as you Ellie play, the memories do not stop with people who were physically in the time and place where the Holocaust happened, but with anyone who wants to take part in the memory. In one play, a Yemenite teenager who stood up and claimed, I'm from the Holocaust. Hitler wanted to get to my family, but he didn't succeed. It. Therefore, this is my story too. And on a different evening, an Arab Christian man who came, uh, came up after the performance shook um, Menking hands and told her, I'm also from the Holocaust. These moments are meaningful and, and touching but also point out the complexity of the memory as it keeps expanding from the one who experienced the trauma on their body to whomever choose to engage with it, interpret it, and receive it as part of their identity. So to conclude, through the representation of memory transmission, um, these theatrical events weave together the voices of four generations, creating a reflective aesthetics that allows us to see the ways in which the next generations negotiate the memory. In this process, when it's open to interaction, the memory will always change. When it comes to Shoah, to Holocaust memory, it is very problematic, of course, to advocate or think about the idea that the story may be changed since it can blur its political implication. And yet, as the creators and the theater stage reflects on the individual intimate layer as a manner to connect to a story, to make it your own, as a form of belonging to a community, um, the memory must be open for negotiation. Therefore, in the current transition into the post-witness era, when the memory shifts from the witnesses to the next generations, it is not enough to preserve the history, but rather it must be negotiated. In that way, the next generation can step into their role as memory carriers and find their place as members of the mnemonic community. And I wanna say something outside the Israeli context that the plays I have discussed today are about the Holocaust, but this discussion um, can be applied to other traumatic events that plays a central role in individuals and collective identity. I don't need to say that today's world is flooded with questions of identity and somehow the memories of painful past play significant roles in this conversation. If we're going back to the question, leading question of how memory shifts or expands from people who directly experience the trauma to people who received it or choose to include it in their identity, I want to suggest that someone else's story become ours when we choose to listen and take responsibility and the burden. I feel that we live in a world where people are quick to adapt someone else's story as an ethical act, right? To send out statements, to take stand so quickly. I feel that sadly knowing and fast acting become valued as ethical gestures more than asking and listening. The idea of witnessing might be leading us to judge by the strong image, not by the stories and the complexity that they held. The reflective aesthetics encourage us to think about the image, the story, who transmitted it and how, and to critically examine our relation to it and the ongoing responsibility that it demands of us. The end.
Thank you, Akinam. That was truly enriching. So, um, I have a question for you. Uh, so now that we know about Holocaust plays and the entire genre of Holocaust theater, do we have an answer for this question that if I would say what type of theater best depicts the Holocaust? Like, is it the one that can provoke mourning for the victims or the one that would not be so immersive and would kind of force the spectator to seek for decisive answers themselves? Um, the idea of immersiveness is, is so powerful, right? And it's something that theater can, can do so well, as well as all the advanced technology that are being um, implemented in the, the VR the, in the past just now in, in the past Biennale, there were four um, pieces of VR um, pieces of, of the Holocaust that really you can experience. And it's powerful to step into really someone else's body and try to think that you are in the moment. But then also my question is where it leads us. I mean, we have, we can always try to go back in time and re-experience what someone else might experience if we can say but does it really takes us to a place that we can um grow our understanding of the situation and i i'm i'm afraid that no not the answer is no because the history is not only what happened but it's still happening and it's still being understood over time so if we're just going back in time without seeing and experiencing and noticing all the layers that were added through the years and more than that if we're not putting ourselves in a position why are we telling this story why do we care about this story we're just missing a huge part of the reason we're dealing with the topic so the immersiveness is um, powerful, um, not necessarily um, effective, in my, my view. Okay. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your questions. Yeah, I'm curious, uh, especially with something like uh, audience participation, it can really sometimes steal the show, if you will, uh, or take people out of um, out of it when breaking the fourth wall kind of thing. Um, do you find that, that there are some tactics or some practices that should not be done because it would end up diluting or trivializing the message of the Holocaust? Or is just about anything is okay? What is the message of the Holocaust? <clears throat> Great question. <laughs> um, the message of the play, I should say. Uh, the message uh, that's being communicated by the play, which I would assume would be to help carry on the memory of the Holocaust in a lot of contexts. Um, so I would say that what is so powerful for me about these plays that their message, they're not carry a specific message about we must remember. They're more provoking questions about how do we remember and why, and why are we carrying this memory and what is our relation and responsibility of it. So the, the, the and these are questions that needs to be asked, right? Because of course there is the memory, we can't ignore it, it's, it's in our veins. Um, so, it is carried. The question is how and what are we doing with it? So this is the essence of the place to ask the questions, to discuss this very question that you just asked. What is the message? The message is, is why, what is the message? This is the question of the play. Well, is there, okay. Um, all right. So assuming that the message is, what is the message? And get the audience to contemplate this. Mm -hmm. Are there any tactics like audience participation but but beyond that uh, that you don't recommend that would maybe steal away too much from it from getting people to ponder and think about the holocaust and its message so the boundaries 
um, the boundaries of representation where it takes it too far? Um, this is a very good question. Um, I'm curious how much is within the, the aesthetic and how much is it's with the context in which the play is being presented and the play and the the location and the society, right? Because the same play that I will present here in Israel that will be very humoristic if I'll play it elsewhere. I'm not sure it will be received or understood in the same way. Um, and this is this is this is culture, right? So it is it is a provoking question to think if we can think of of guidelines that are across all cult. This is interesting. Also, it's a good question. Um, maybe maybe we can find it if we'll. We'll do some kind of comparative. No, but it's it's so different. Each place, like now being in France and and France and just starting to look on their theater, it's um, so different. Yeah, and you know, I can I can see the French uh, having a sense of humor about it potentially. Israel definitely has the best sense of humor when it comes to the Holocaust. Um, but then outside, it's uh, yeah, you're you're. Not yet. <laughs> it's Not so yet. which is kind of interesting because depending on uh how you are communicating and how you're presenting the information uh through humor especially mm -hmm. in one location it's not gonna it, it's not gonna it that detracts and so it's it's on the boundary is literally a geographical boundary sometimes mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah i and you know a couple things come to my mind for instance Maybe taking the audience participation too far might be something like having one audience member or a cast member on their knees and an audience member pretends to point a gun and shoot the person in the back of the head. Um, to and, do that? Well, I'm, I'm trying to think of the most extreme examples I can. Some kind of, uh, of, of theater part, audience participation in, into the... To the theater uh into the play i think it's it there are other projects which i i find them i find a little bit um i find them a little bit problematic that are trying to what um, um what we discussed before the idea of immersive theater that try to take you back back in time and then they're using audience participation and they're kind of throwing you back into what happened in the ghetto and you're in the situation and you need to make a decision it's kind of an educational pro, um, project and i find it problematic and because in these places this something this thing can happen and and why why would we want that um but in places when we're in a living room or in the kitchen right like <clears throat> we are we are right now in we're not trying to go back in time. We're in the very present moment. And, and there, I hope things like that won't. And if they will, it's also how, how you react to that or what it adds to the conversation. I don't know. I, I never haven't experienced that. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's just an interesting thing to think about where, if, if there is a line, where should it be at all? Um, because, you know, artists are going to push the envelope and uh, as they should. Um, I just wonder. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. The Mariana Abramovich with the, with the gun, right? When she put herself to this performance, something can happen. It, it is, it can be dangerous, but that's yeah. what makes it theater. The other uh, thing I want to ask you, um, and maybe this is a bit more of a personal question, what your method is, but I'd like to know in general what other, um, especially Israeli actors, are doing. Um, now, I understand that your particular play uh, is comedic, but how, uh, how do you and other actors protect yourselves from traumatizing yourself by getting into character hmm. for some of these plays for 
And especially, and I'm thinking more of the, the more serious where you are in fact a prisoner in a hollow in a concentration camp. Um, um, well, there are very interesting um, research about it, uh, including one um, by Ruti Abilovich. She wrote about um, a Holocaust survivor who played um, a Holocaust survivor on, on stage, and then a couple of years later, he um, took his life. Um, but I want to say again, um, I, I, I don't know, like this is not something I'm, I'm dealing with with this particular question of the, um, the psychology of, of actors. Um, and one of the reason I think I'm not dealing with it is because I'm, I'm curious about the other option of theater, which is not to act out the past is to act out our relation to the past. So with none of these performances, no one is is stepping into the shoes of someone in the past. They're doing it in other ways, um, through puppetry, through object theater. And then you're not step you're not you're you're not embodying anything. You're using symbols, you're using sound, you use materials that that you're always able to, you always put yourself in a place that you have a relation with the materials that that you are now um 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 oh my god <laughs> you are now using to demonstrate the the situation that you're talking about so um so you need to i want to say we have this powerful tool that calls um um an aesthetic distance and our maybe um, I don't know why I'm really stuck with the uh, with answer right now, but um, maybe because I'm talking about about reflection and about stepping back from the situation. But um, yeah, I want to say that theater can get us very close to a situation, but it also can give us perspective. And I want to push us towards the perspective no. possibilities. No, um... Yeah, I love that. And then that's the beauty of, of live performances, especially, but of um of theater. It, I I remember um this is years and years ago. I was um in a play and I it was actually just a two person play. Um and we were both playing homosexuals in a concentration camp, and all we did throughout the entire thing was we kept moving a set of boulders from one pile to the other over and over for the entire play as we're doing this dialogue. And um, I always, I, I go back to that because I'm thinking, uh, so I was, uh, I was classically trained in what's called the shirt left method and not, which is not to, uh, which is not, is pretty much the opposite of, of um, method acting where you are basically trying to become that person and feel mm -hmm. all the emotions and stuff because of how much psychological damage it can do to the actors. Um, and it's just too easy. I mean, it's just, it plays too much to emotion and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And the method that I was trained in was you focused on the action that's being done on stage, what you are wanting to accomplish with mm -hmm. And through the other character or through the uh, the objects on stage, I can just see that being a very useful thing, especially for descendants of Holocaust victims playing Holocaust, <laughs> Holocaust prison or uh, concentration camp prisoners and things like that, um, because I it will to me it'll naturally stir up a lot of deep heavy things for them, mm -hmm. and we want to kind of isolate and protect them from that a little bit so mm -hmm. i'm just throwing my two cents out there thanks for entertaining it how but how was it for you um well <laughs> the uncomfortable thing for me was um my co-star had a uh um he and i had a very unique relationship so playing 
we were we were supposed to be lovers and there were some kissing scenes in there <clears throat> and this is back when i was deeply fundamentalist christian and so um it that was what made it incredibly uncomfortable for me um and i just remember using that uncomfortableness trying to almost live in it so that and let it out in the performance letting that be kind of shine through so um that's what stands out to me the most i don't know if it succeeded or not i don't know mm -hmm. how you know uh psychologically or anything else i think i was so in here because of my own issues my and religious background stuff that i'm not so sure i was fully present with being a, a, as a performer and this is part of the the power of theater, right? That you can really become someone else and and try to experience, understand the mo motives, the um, the the questions, the the conflicts within person and within a situation, um, and to to act or to be someone which is not yours, which is not yourself. So this is also a, a precious precious thing. Oh yeah. All right. Do we have any further questions? I don't see any. So, um, Akinam, thank you once again. And I'll, since I don't see any further questions, so I'll have you, uh, you'll have the last word. Hmm. Uh, so thank you again for holding the, holding the space and for this, um, um this conversation i think my my last word is is about um the responsibility that we must take when we take someone else's story and um the the power of image and the 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 power of image and the way that we need to um to see behind beyond it and um Maybe I'll, I'll end with a question that I'm, I'm going with when I when I see the the power of um, the, the need for for reflection, just as a, as a scholar's question that I'm working with is when is our time to um, to act with the um, with maybe the perspective we gain through the research and when when we're talking about representation of a cultural representation how much can we shape how much it makes its own way um, when something occur so this tension between shaping with what we know or observing with the tools we gain so um this is just it's not a statement again it's a question to end with <laughs>